Hey everybody and welcome to another Thwack Livecast. Uh, we're going to be talking about Orion Automation Made Easy and this is part one where we're going to let the platform do most of the work for you. Uh, as I have on the screen here, my name is Kevin Sparenberg. I am the technical content manager for Thwack and basically just spend all my day on there either harassing, no, scratch it, helping people <laughs> get the most out of their solutions. <laughs> Uh, and with me, we have Assistant. a couple other. Yeah, I see the quotes, Leon. Thanks. Uh, uh, so I also have Crystal and Leon. Crystal, say hello. Hello. <laughs> Live Leon. TV, nothing Hi. better. Hi. <laughs> and I'm Leon Adato. Yes. And that was Crystal. And hi, Kevin. No. And for those people who've never been on a webcast with us before, um, I'm going to warn you, we could talk literally about almost anything for as much time as you give us. So we're going to try to remain focused, but uh, you, this conversation could go off the rails at any moment. Who knows? Yeah. Right? And <laughs> more air quotes. Facts. Yeah. 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 This is also true. Um, <laughs> so we have the chat. If you're watching us live, it's over here. Please ask your questions in there. We will have some moderators bubbling that stuff. We'll, stuff up. We'll answer questions at the end of the session. Like I said earlier, this is part one. Part two is the same time, same place, thwack.com slash livecast, which is also after this one is done, you can see previous episodes. So you can go there, register for the second one, which we're going to be digging more into the API. Uh, this time we're going to kind of stay in the web side of things. It touches the API, it does in the back end, and it'll get you in the right mindset of where you want to go for that session. That one is, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's December 9th. Uh, 10 a.m. Yes. Central. Awesome sauce. Yeah. So let's continue on. Uh, we got a quick agenda here. We're going to talk about the basically a bunch of different ways you can automate things because if we are completely honest with ourselves, you can always get more money. <laughs> you can always get more money from <laughs> IT people. Yeah, everyone's laughing because we've all been Show in IT. Show me how. Now. I want to know how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you make it up. That's a different thing. Yeah, <laughs> oh, different, different conversation. We'll Maybe we'll that have that one. one. After that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in theory, you can always get more money. In theory, you can get more headcount. In theory, you can get more CPU, memory, et cetera. What you can never get more of is time. True. It's, it's the one resource that when it's gone, is gone forever. So that's kind of the impetus for this, where we want to make sure that everyone comes in and if you build these automations, you save yourself time. Now, does it make you look good? Absolutely. Does it help your workload? Yeah, but the whole idea is that you can take that time and put it to, I don't know, your real IT projects that you should be working on. So just one of the things. Uh, we've got discovery templates. We're gonna talk about custom property assignment automatically, uh, dynamic groups and some of the great stuff you can do with that. Application template assignment, firmware deployment, compliance remediation actions. That's a lot of fun. And then alert based remediation. And we are going to talk way too much about all of these. So I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> pretty much. Um, so, Crystal, you've spent a lot of time working with customers and in their environments. Talk to me about the improvements we made to the discovery wizard. Discovery, yeah, dis Discovery is amazing. So everyone is familiar with the Discovery if you've used the product at all, because it's literally the first thing that you're required to do as soon as you log in, it takes you to the Discovery page. So you know what it is. Um, what people don't realize a lot of times though, is that you can set it up to schedule regular scans so that when things are added to your environment, you pick them up automatically. Cause let's be real, people are not communicating like they should and telling the monitoring person that they're adding stuff until like weeks or months later when something happened and now they need to know why. Um, so that's what happens, but to avoid that, you can set up um, automatic scanning and the newer improvements mean that you can also set up automatic um, monitoring on those devices that you scan. Because previously you do a scan and then later you go back and you look at what it found and then you can import that based on whatever you decide you want to do with the importing, right? Like maybe you don't want to monitor everything. Maybe you want to monitor loopbacks. Maybe you don't want to monitor loopbacks. Maybe you need to monitor all the um, mount drives. Maybe you don't. Whatever the case may be, you would go and do that manually. And now you have the option of setting up criteria to automatically add things to monitoring based on that criteria. Yeah. So Which, 
this is actually, here it is, the defining monitoring, choose what to monitor. And this will, of course, change depending on the, the modules you have installed on top of the Orion platform. The system we're working with today is current Rev, Hotfix 2, and is running pretty much everything under the sun. Uh, honestly, the interfaces and the volumes are my two favorite parts of these. Mm -hmm. be because <laughs> I'm going to just say this real fast. Interface description matches regular expression. Done. Literally with this one line, if you know regex, or better yet, if you have a friend who's a developer who knows regex, <laughs> much better. Or you can cheat. There's a bunch of online resources to paste stuff in and see if it matches. I, Not that I ever use them because I have regex in the back of my head. Um, Along with your seventh grade uh, locker combination. Sadly, I do remember my bowling locker combination to get my ball. Anyway, uh, so moving on. Uh, <laughs> This also applies to volumes because for me, the way I ran my environment, I never really cared about certain things. Like I didn't care about cache space for Linux machines because I was getting that through a different metric and I didn't care about uh, swap space because it's kind of fixed on most Linux systems. So if you monitor swap space, it's like, cool, 99.9% .9 consumed all the time. I'm like, new, no, don't care. It's fixed, just let it happen. Uh, yeah. But Crystal, like you said, whether or not you want to watch mount points or network drives, those are really important, especially if you have something like uh, SRM, uh, the storage resource monitor, and they're already monitoring that from the array side. Do you technically need to double monitor it? It depends. Depends who your alert, who your dashboards and everything are going to. Yeah. And I will say, like, also, you don't have to just have one. Even if your environment isn't super large, you can set up multiple scheduled discoveries so you can have different sets of criteria for adding to monitoring for depending on where it's at. Maybe uh, maybe you have a, a list of devices that you want or a list of subnets that you want to scan regularly that is going to be an office environment. You will need different things than, than you would need in a different environment. Data center, you'd have different things maybe you want to monitor. So you can set up multiples. Also, set up multiples and do not do, make sure you're doing them at different times so they're not running at the same time and overlapping just to, to save yourself headaches um, later. Mm -hmm. Have them have them run at separate times. Yeah. Right. And the, another thing that I think people overlook is, um, I mean, when they think about discovery, they think about, again, that first big push. How do I get everything into Orion? But right. I think that the ongoing thing and also using this as a tool to, to find things that shouldn't be there. For example, if you've got, a classroom, and you know that none of the classroom boxes need to be monitored, you still probably ought to run a discovery on that classroom subnet. Hopefully you have a subnet as opposed to just a list of machines, but whatever it is, so to find out if somebody put a server under a desk in the classroom, not that I've seen that twice in my career, but you know, to say, why is this in this area? What is this doing? Um, and also to break up different areas of the environment, even if it's not particularly large, having a discovery just for your servers, having a discovery just for your network infrastructure, having a discovery just for your containers or your IoT devices or whatever it is, can really start to show you the fluidity of your environment, even if it's just, you know, a couple dozen. Yeah. And uh, I mean, monitoring stops being useful if you're not keeping it up to date. So. Uh, that's that's on you. It requires maintenance. It doesn't matter what monitoring system you have. It requires maintenance. You have to be paying attention, adding devices to your monitoring in order for it to be as useful as you want it to be. Yeah. And to that point, we have the argument of how much maintenance do you want to do? Well, I want to do as little as possible. So let's build these discoveries. And maybe we just send it against one office, one branch location. And we're expecting this to come back. And then we see it, we go through the discovery results without setting up this auto import and say, oh, okay, so this is what would come in. I don't like that. I want these other things. So you go back, you edit it. You basically delete the discovery results, you try it again. And then once you have it, then it really is just lather, rinse, repeat for the other ones. It's just yeah. do the same thing, but not in 10.12 slash 16. Now do it in 10.22 slash 16 and ta-da, you're done. I do like the thing about loopback. A lot of people argue that we don't need loopbacks. I argue we do. That's a different discussion. We could have that at a later time. It is a different discussion. We have had it more than once. 
Okay. I think we okay, have it every here. time Crystal and I are in the same place, honestly. And Leon has has only been in the peripheral, but I know he has opinions. So I, I think the problem is if you're arguing it from the standpoint of a network engineer, a Linux sysadmin, or a Windows sysadmin, how strongly you feel about which answer that might be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll accept that. All right. All right, what else we got today? Oh, custom property assignment. So everyone already knows, yeah, Crystal, I know we're all happy. All, all three of us are incredibly happy about custom properties. If you're not using them, you are seriously sleeping on one of the superpowers of the Orion platform. Because I think at last count, there are 22 different entity types that can have custom properties. That's a lot. Um, yeah. And assigning them, you can of course make these mandatory which is fine. But that means when you go through a node wizard or an add node wizard, at the very end, you got the block and you have to select the things from the list. All right, that's acceptable. But what happens if you need to retro this stuff? Well, you can, it's not that hard. You can go into the new custom properties uh, in Orion platform 2020.2.6. We actually went and rebuilt the custom properties management pages, so it's a little easier to like do bulk assignments. Uh, that being said, why not skip it? So this is kind of my scenario, and I've been in a lot of, I've, this is the scenario that I came from, this is the scenario that I know a lot of customers are in. Things generally have a naming scheme. That's not 100% the case, in which case you may need to tweak this for yours. We you did hope. talk yesterday <laughs> about people who name them after the seven dwarves or the the names of the Nazgul from Lord of the Rings or right. cartoon characters or yeah. anything else. I will not lie. I had a domain controller called Shaggy for a while in honor of uh, Norville Shaggy Rogers because I'm I like Scooby Doo. Uh, but maybe you actually have everything that's like I don't know in your East Coast data center. Start with the word East or maybe just EA or something like that. It won't mm -hmm. be impossible to figure these out. Uh, the company I was with before had six characters. When we went international, it was uh, country, country. It was the, uh, I forget what the RFC or thing is, but the, the two character country, the two character city, this two character county, city, whatever, and then two more for something. Else. Yeah, they had it set up. But you probably have something like this, whether it's based around location or whether it's based around function, like all of your exchange servers. I know I'm dating myself. All of your exchange servers have EXCH somewhere in the name. So I want to share this I scenario think... real fast. Uh, so set up, you've got the device naming and you've built a custom property for region. Uh, it's just a text one, it's bound to nodes. You've done this before, it's nothing crazy. We've got lots of resources on how to do this we create an alert. So basically we're using the Orion alerting engine to do this work for us. And we will show this in addition to a lot of other actions later. Um, so the alert says if the name matches, but the custom property doesn't match. In other words, if I have East Linux 01, but it doesn't have the region of East defined or East Coast data center or what have you, then, then take an action. And that action would be assign a custom property. Mm -hmm. Now, caveat. No. So I, I just want to point out that in, in the course of my career, uh, if I've seen a naming standard, I've seen exceptions to that naming standard, which equal or overwhelm the actual boxes that apply, adhere to the naming standard. Like it, it's, it's a really good idea but the mechanics of it in anything but a greenfield company that is just building an entirely new fresh slate of, of devices is often you've just got legacy devices that can't be renamed and they can't be moved because too many applications actually have it hard coded and blah, 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 blah. My point is not naming standards stuck or you can't do what Kevin's talking about. My point is that custom properties can help you overcome the limitations of naming standards because now you can apply custom properties that are both accurate and fluid in the sense that if it doesn't have the right name, but it's in the right subnet, you can either manually or programmatically apply the custom property that says, no, really, this is part of the East environment, or this is part of the branch environment or whatever it is. And therefore, all your other automation, your alerts and everything else can still apply. 
So in some cases, custom properties are more powerful than a lockstep naming standard because there is no such thing as a lockstep naming standard. There's always going to be that one box that's, you know, not doing it. So that's the only thing I wanted to point out is A, naming standards are uh, imperfect at best, and B, custom properties are your way around it. Yeah, and I wanted to bring up, I know that, Kevin, you had there that custom property is empty for this, but I did want to say that if you were in a position of cleaning up an environment, that you may want to not include that, but you'd probably need to be sure first. Do a search before you set up the alert. That's all I'm going to add to that. But in that way, you know, if it's not empty, you're not worried about it. You can do a cleanup before you get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it's actually uh, an or logic in there. If it's null or the name doesn't match, then trigger it. If either of those is not true, in other words, something is in there, just not what you want, then maybe someone manually put something in there intentionally or they fat fingered something. It happens. Uh, I'll also throw out there, just so we don't get stuck on naming schemes, that if you don't have a naming scheme or because you're a small shop or whatever, um, the chances are that someone did an IP scheme, in which case you can do um, subnets based on locations and things like that. There's there's a lot of people that do it that way instead, especially if they came more from a networking background and they don't really care about the names. I have noticed this many times. Um, so you could, instead of doing a device naming scheme for your setup, you could do an IP address scheme instead to, to match for your um, custom properties. So. <sighs> Just saying, so don't I'm get stuck on device naming being the only way is not the only way. Um, but whatever your criteria happens to be for the setup, you can use that to uh, assign custom properties. And I'm just going to jump in here and say that please, for the love of all that is holy, and ice cream and pants, please, <laughs> Nate, if you're going to do IP-based splits, do them on the on the subnet break not on a random human numerical break. It does not do your network any good to have one to 100 in a class C slash 24 network being something. Do it at the <laughs> subnet break. <laughs> Right, please. And if that doesn't make any sense, come find me afterward. We'll talk it through. We will. We will is... totally. We will talk your ear off on this. And if there are questions about it, we will get to them at the end. Um, I wanted to share. I wanted to share this. And yeah, uh, realistically, name is something, or in the Orion parlance, caption is something that everyone's familiar with, but it's not authoritative which is why I wouldn't use this in a production environment. I would probably go with IP. IP starts with 10.1 dot, and that'll basically give me all the slash 16s behind that, and then that would say go to this particular data center. We're using caption in this example because it's something that you may have control of, and that means if you need to impose at least from a monitoring level some type of naming convention, you can. Uh, let me see if I actually have this up. So yeah, here we go. This is my node region to East Coast Data Center. So I'm going to just show this real fast. So I like to basically write fake pseudocode here. And then for me, this is a notice because I don't care. I just, just do it. Uh, the trigger condition, like I said, is going to be for nodes where <clears throat> The node name starts with east, and the children is not equal to East Coast Data Center because that's what we want. That's our mapping. We want east to go to East Coast Data Center for the custom property, and the region is not is empty. So that's pretty simple. So that way, if anything is in there, like someone started filling stuff in manually, then this won't happen. Super simple reset. Not really necessary for this. I'm going to jump to trigger actions. That's the important part here. Come on, demo gods. There we go. Uh, yeah. That This is it. This is it. Literally change the custom property to East Coast Data Center. Save changes. Next, next finish. Enable it. Probably have this thing run once a day, once a week. You do not need to run this every 60 seconds. That is unnecessary for this kind of uh, maintenance level. If you want to run it every hour, fine. It'll probably hit a whole bunch of alerts in the first pass. 
and trigger a whole bunch of changes and then hit progressively fewer and fewer. So it's not going to be a huge drain on your environment. But checking every minute is unnecessary for this. And, and that's something for those people who are maybe not haven't dug deep into alerts, please remember the default is that the alert checks for a condition every minute. That's a query running against your entire database every minute. Please decide whether that's necessary, especially when we're talking about maintenance type things like this. Yeah. And if yeah. you want this particular one, we actually have it available on FWAC on the, in the Orion platform under Content Exchange. So there will be a link at the end and in the resources. You can actually just download this and import it right into your system. I believe I have it enabled by default or disabled by default. So you can see what it would look like and then enable it. Because if people haven't said anything, the best thing, and I don't know if I'm going to have any triggers on this one, the best thing that we've ever added to the web based is this. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, you know yes. what? I'm just going to do this. I would have brought that up if you didn't. Because this is the absolute best thing. If you hit submit at this point, you have been warned. It's done. Um, OK. As somebody who has launched 700 alerts to the knock twice <laughs> in 15 minutes and had the entire knock visit my desk to say, if you do that again, we're going to go outside. Like, we, please we riot. just. Yeah. It's yeah. super useful. All right. So then we want to talk a little bit about dynamic groups. A lot of people build groups by hand, which is fine. Uh, maybe you mm -hmm. do need to do that for specific reasons or because of feelings or what have you, or because someone said, hey, I only need to be able, this particular team, the example I get a lot is this particular team only needs to be able to see these six things. They're not in the same place. They're not really associated in a way that's super clear from the, from the monitoring level, but that's all they need to see. All right, so we'll right. basically manually build a group, drag those elements in, and then people can see the group page. Fine, great. Right. But right. It... no, please. OK, fine, I'll go. Um, so just to talk about why not dynamic groups, I think one of the, the most useful cases for not dynamic groups is an application, an actual service. I don't mean like a service running on Windows. I mean like a service that we provide, whether it's customer order or entry or whatever, where you've got these two databases and these net, this network gear and these five servers and this load balancer and whatever, whatever, whatever. And that all goes together to provide this capability of the business, both either internally or externally. That's a not dynamic group because humans have to know which boxes and which systems and which elements are involved and which ones aren't. But for a I lot of things that we do, oh, sorry, Crystal, go ahead. I'd still argue for with use of custom properties using dynamic groups. Uh, sure. Even, okay. even in that scenario. OK. The, I mean, dynamic is, again, more flexible and more robust going forward. It's less maintenance on the back end. But I'm just saying mm -hmm. that that's one where you could wrap your head around, why would I do a manual grouping? Yeah. Dynamic groups are for basically everything else. Um, and what I want to do, so you see the stuff on the screen. Those are just three truths of working in IT. But I want to show what these dynamic groups look like. So I want to start off just by pointing to an existing group. So we have this web ops group. And I'm going to apologize. My screen is really fuzzy. Um, Kevin is actually driving the demo. So I'm just going to trust his eyes to take us through. So we've got this web ops group. And if we look at the query for that, if we look at what's uh, you know making that thing up, so if we just go and, you know, yeah. Uh, I'm editing just it. Edit it. OK, good. So you can see it's a really simple one. Um, it, it's really just the things where the custom property is web ops. Mm -hmm. And anything that gets that custom property is now part of the dynamic group for whatever reason. Now, that can be everything from a status where you have a roll up status of like everything in the web ops group is now OK or not OK or whatever to alerting to a few other things that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But I want to talk about how to build one. So we can go back to the, um, you know, create a new dynamic group. And there we go. And I want to um, do where vendor is. Oh, so we can call it, I don't know. There I just called it my so, livecast group. Uh, so I'm in dynamic query, and we want to do. Yeah, dynamic. Right. So my query. So we want to do nodes. That's what we want in this one, right? Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we don't, and you could do interfaces, you could do whatever. We're going to keep it simple for right now. And we want to do where the vendor is Cisco. Got and it. to your point about IP addresses, where the IP address. All right. IP. And there's, yeah, IP begins with or starts with, and we're going to do 10.1 that. 10.1 dot or just 10.1? Uh, we'll do 10.1 dot because okay. I really do want the one dot, not the 100 dot or the 11 dot. Or the 11 or the 12 whatever. or 13. Or you see where we're going. Uh, right. And what I like about this is before you even save this, there's a preview. Right. So, one, two. So, this it, is all of the Cisco gear now in the East Coast because it starts with East, but maybe your naming scheme is not this way. Naming schemes for these kinds of things are very common, especially if you work in a DMZ space where the names are pseudo ridiculous and they're supposed to be that way through for obfuscation purposes. So much better to trigger off IPs. Uh, one thing here that I will say caught me is I always thought, oh, because now I have saved my query and that's all I can have in here. No, no, it's not. You can have additional dynamic queries. So if you have a location right. that used to be IP'd to 10.11, and then they expanded and they said, oh, we're going to build a new one. It's 10.21. You're like, oh, I can just add another one in here with that other filter. And then the two of them roll together. Uh, and that is important because you'll notice if you look at the dynamic query options, there's no or. Yes. So how, right. you can have multiple dynamic queries in a group that takes care of your or. Mm -hmm. And then for me, the one thing I always forgot was I would immediately be like, okay, cool, it's there and I'm going somewhere else. No, you actually have to sit and hit create group. And this is like, this also speaks to just your screen size. And if you're working in a little window, sometimes that little blue button in the lower right corner is cut off. Please look for the little blue button. Just make sure that there's nothing else to be clicked. You'll make that mistake once or twice and then you'll never make it again because you will hate yourself. Um, yeah. And so there, I mean, you can look at the, the group as if it was its own entity uh, and see the status of all the items in there. But the, the point is, is that as devices begin to uh, meet those that criteria, they're part of that group, the vendor is identified, the IP address, so you could have a Cisco device that was in a 10.2 subnet that then moved into the 10.1 and it would automatically become part of the group, which is important for some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about here in a minute. But I just wanted to mm -hmm. make sure that that people understood how dynamic groups were. Because again, it's a super powerful thing because in the name of not having to do things over again, you never <clears> have to touch this again. The things will automatically fall into the group if they match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of that, um, that is where we talk about uh, dependencies. So we don't have a slide for dependencies, but I do want to talk about it briefly in context with dynamic groups because it's super useful. That ability to just um, change a custom property or add a new device and it meets the criteria and automatically gets added to the group is hugely useful, especially if you're using dependencies for location. So like if you have a remote site or you have multiple offices, you're going to have your your edge routers and things and then you know if you're pulling it from a data center if that edge router goes down you can't reach anything behind it anyway right so if you can't reach anything behind it anyway you don't need all of everything at that site to go down instead the edge router goes down and everything else goes into an unreachable state with dependencies and you can use groups as a parent or as a child and this is also useful if you have multiples right you have a primary and you have a backup if both of them go down then you need to not get alerted on the rest of your stuff. If only one of them goes down, then you still want to get alerted because you can still reach them. So that's really key in building these dependencies. And I've seen layers of these dynamic groups and dependencies built for, um, for sites specifically. So they had like routers and they had switches that they could access. So if they couldn't get there one way, they had routes set up to go there another way. And it was all complicated networking stuff that I don't understand because I'm not in networking. But um, what was important was setting up these groups so that instead of getting a bunch, you know, 50, 100 different alerts on all of that stuff going down, they would get one. Mm -hmm. The one, the group, one alert the and everything else goes into an down. unreachable state. And um, that then you can, you know, troubleshoot what's going on with your edge routers, but that's a different problem. That's why I wanted to talk about them in context with dependencies. Obviously, you can do dependencies 
with single items as well. Um, but I think the, the useful option for what we're talking about today, which is automating things, is using those dynamic groups in, and it doesn't have to be locations. Locations is the easiest example I can give, but like if you add new, uh, new devices to that site and they automatically get added into that group, you don't have to worry about the dependency. They're already built in because you built it with that dynamic group. Yeah, applications are actually a really good one as well because like the, the classic example is web middle database where this series of web servers, the physical servers themselves or even virtual, but the boxes themselves don't need the middleware to exist. But the web processes, the Apache, the IIS, the Nginx, whatever, that does require the middleware service to be up. And that middleware service being up in operation requires, and it's probably multiples, those group require the database, which might be in a high availability, availability pair. So you have, realistically, you build a parent, child, parent, child. And if you have them all in dynamic groups based on name, IP, something like that, then you have a great way to just build that stuff automatically. And you don't have to worry about, like Leon alluded to, the 700 emails when <laughs> something in your remote data center, like the WAN router in your remote data center blips for 60 seconds. You can get an alert for everything behind that, or, or you can get an alert that that site is having a problem. Yeah. Mark Robinson in the chat it said a little bit ago that dependencies will keep the operations and on-call engineers from hunting you down. <laughs> True words may never have been spoken. Yeah, I'll agree with that. So on the tune of applications, I don't know how many people um, are still aware of this. So after you finish the discovery wizard, at the end, you can also do this through the SAM settings, but at the end, there's another button. There's not just finish. There's, I think it says add applications and it takes you to the mm -hmm. application scanner. Someone speak to this for me because I have opinions. <laughs> I have, okay. Well, I mean, we all have opinions. That's what we do. Um, but the application uh, wizard, so you, the, uh, I captured this from the standalone, but uh, like you said, you can do it at the end of your regular network discovery as well, where you add the applications. I want to make sure that I mention that you can set your criteria in the standalone discovery for what nodes you scan as well as straight from your network discovery. So whatever that was decided via custom properties or whatever for the scanning to add these applications, it applies. Um, I also wanna make sure I talk about the fact that even though you're, it defaults to showing the popular applications, you can get that drop down and you can, any application template that you have in your environment imported from Thwack, created on your own, custom templates, whatever, you can include in this scanning process. And I also want to talk about the fact that you can do um, the matching, it's like minimal, uh, what is minimal good and then like better at best kind of a situation, exact match better matching, whatever. Basically, that means I, I want to emphasize that I don't suggest anyone do minimal matching. The reason why I'm going to say that is because if you scan, even if it's like 10 devices and you're using several templates, even just one template, a lot of templates have things like port scans in them, which is like a, or not port scan, a port monitor that monitors a specific port. Let's say it's port 80. Well, if you monitor a bunch of, if you're uh, trying to add it to a bunch of servers and it's actually, you know, an IIS template, and so it's monitoring port A, but if you can monitor port 80 and it's open on any of those servers, whether or not they have IIS, it's gonna get added if you have it on like minimal matching. So make sure that you're paying attention to that. Um, I don't necessarily think you always need to go for exact matches because then you'll miss out on things. Like I know there are a bunch of things with like exchange servers where you can add specific services on and those are included in the templates, whether they're there or not. You can just later go disable those in the template for that specific application because it doesn't apply, it doesn't have that specific role or whatever. Um, so, you know, Find, find your happy medium in there, but you can do the scanning and find things. And this is really useful if you're, let's say, um, typically a network person, but you're having to add monitoring for the systems people and you don't really know what's on there. Um, they're, they're telling you it's SQL, but you don't know what they want. Those conversations may or may not be happening of like, hey, we need exactly this. And a lot of times they don't know 
what exactly they can get. And because they don't know what exactly they can get, this is really useful. So you have something to take back to them and say, okay, we can get this. What is good for you in here? What is not good for you in here? And then they can tell you whether or not they need all of that information and you can pare it down from there. But I think that this is really useful for those types of scenarios where you have um, not as much experience, you know, like I'm, I'm not an exchange administrator. I don't necessarily know exactly what is important to care about for that exchange server, but with the monitoring, I can tell you, we can get this. Do you need that? Do you not need that? And that'll spark their brain to spark that conversation to say, oh, but you're not getting this. And this is something I care about. And then you can go back and refine it from there. But it, this is a, a starting point for those conversations, which we uh, constantly emphasize are so important to having good monitoring. The only way that people care about your monitoring is if it's good for them. That's just the facts. It's only the facts. If it doesn't do anything for them, if it's not getting them the information that they need, if it's not alerting them on the things they care about, then they stop caring about the monitoring. That's just the way it works. Truer words have Preach. not been spoken. It's realistically, especially at in your work life, you are going to be selfish about the things you need to get your job done. This is just one way to spur that conversation. Uh, there is more information. If you go into this in your system, you can click more information about matching and it will tell you there is a very distinct algorithm that says how we do this matching and how things are weighted and what's important. Uh, I have run this in against like three servers just to see at exact and then bringing it back each time. And minimal mm -hmm. is, yeah, let's not do that one. Uh, it works, but it's too happy. Um, it's too, yeah. The other thing is, all right, let's say you have these templates and maybe you built one specifically for, I don't know, your, your aging BlackBerry enterprise server infrastructure. <laughs> Please, God, don't have them anymore. Maybe you do. Don't I don't know. I don't it. want to judge. But I had to build that template once. Everyone's laughing at me. Go ahead, get it out. <laughs> no, I'm laughing at the idea. Just please, if you have an ancient BlackBerry server, call. I mean, do you need therapy? Do you need a hug? <laughs> Really, we have how couches. can we help you? Yes, um, uh. <laughs> but I want to. I, I want to just pick up this theme of you know combining the last couple of topics, the dynamic groups and the templates, is that you can assign a template to a dynamic group, and this is one of those really powerful and not always recognized things when you're just tooling around and playing around with things in the first time, is that you can assign as as it shows on the slide here, assign to a group. So if there's a group, dynamic group based on the uh, based on the custom property of server type, and the server type is BlackBerry, you know, then it will automatically get the group. And if you remove it from the group, the template is unassigned. One of the really tedious ongoing uh, tasks a monitoring engineer has is having to chase after our consumer groups, the server team, the application team, the whatever, to find out, is this server still in here? Because it's been down for a month. Like, what is this? And, you know, finding out what it is and allowing the natural aspects of the server. Oh, no, we re-IP'd it. We're using it for a different project right now. Well, mm -hmm. I could automatically pick up that information. But man if it was manually assigned as a template i would never know that and i'd be getting alerts and all that stuff so if it picks up those natural uh elements of the box that allow it to apply you know re remove itself from a dynamic group which then also removes the template from it oh my gosh the hours you say the headaches you say the yeah the quantity of alcohol consumed <laughs> that you say it's really it's amazing. I don't know. I don't know if we can claim that after the last, you know, year and a half that you can save on, on alcohol consumed. Yeah. From this. From this. Fair. Fair. That's, yeah. I'll accept that. <laughs> this was actually one of the biggest things for me that I went through and used to have to go basically once a week and years ago, granted, but I used to go once a week, see if anything came in that matched this name, match this name. Okay. They didn't put in these properties, put in these custom properties, go into the SAM side, be like, uh, there's no template assigned. Go back into the admin, find the thing. And now I can just do, uh, just build the group. And then when they're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> joke on you, not really needed mm -hmm. anymore. And they change whatever, change the name, uninstall something. I can just be like, cool, no problem. I'm just going to sit back and wait. It'll probably go to an unknown state briefly. 
which is fine. That's why we typically don't have our alert engine send on unknowns because it'll go unknown, the components and the template, and then mm -hmm. it will just be removed because you don't need it anymore. All right, so switching gears, I want to talk about firmware deployment. Firmware deployment is one of those things that everyone, if you're a NetEng, you have done this. You have probably done it at small scale. You have probably had your blue cable. We all know what I'm talking about. We've all had our blue cable there as backup. And then you started working in larger environments and you didn't have the kind of failover that you wanted. You didn't necessarily have technical hands in the location to be able to do this work for you. So SolarWinds realized this was a problem and said, we need to normalize this since it's realistically, it's a lather, rinse, repeat process over and over and over again. Let's just work with that because you use the same commands, you do the same thing. And realistically, the firmware, the, the firmware deployment wizard that we have in Orion actually calculates the hash and does a hash check, which is brilliant because that's something I neglected to do. I would check the file size and be like, it's fine. Really shouldn't have done that. I should have taken this extra step. But that's not the way I was taught. Uh, so this would fix that. Um, if you haven't set this up, but you have Network Configuration Manager, it's actually really easy. You've got your Orion server over yonder. You basically have a folder somewhere. Uh, I used to actually keep this on like a NAS share. So people could just throw files in it that way. They didn't have to remote over to the Orion server. Uh, or you could back this with something like DFS so it's synchronized between locations. Regardless, you have a place, you go through the web console, and you say, this is my firmware repository, and I want to scan it. And I think I have one where I can show the repo. It's fairly basic. Oh, that is really zoomed in to show stuff. Uh, NCM settings. Mm, firmware upgrades. Firmware repository. This is it. I mean, really, you, you pick a location. We automatically pull in the file name, description, n node, and IP address, or something you can customize if you want, the hash, and the time. These haven't been updated in a while. This is a demo system, not really live production. But having these in a separate place that you don't necessarily have to maintain yourself, like if someone detects a problem and, I don't know, there's a, a CVV of 9.7 on this particular thing, and it's remedied by this particular firmware version, you can be like, Cool, junior admin, I need you to download that. I need you to run your own MD5, and then I need you to copy it into this folder, and we'll go from there. The important discussion here is this is not necessarily set it and forget it in scale. On single target, this is practically set it and forget it. If you are doing one node, one router, one switch in every branch office, doesn't matter if you've got 500 branch offices, this can be set it and forget it. Because you basically say, set it here. I wanted to send this firmware to all of these devices. You know, it'll do whatever it checks and everything's fine. And then you say, cool, I accept those changes, schedule it for a certain time or go and do it now. Networks aren't that easy anymore. Networks have leaves, they have branches, they have trees, they have architecture unto themselves. And that's the important part. Uh, if this is your environment, your Orion server's over yonder, if you go here on the right side and let's say you do this first top level switch, which, uh, what is that? Layer three, layer two, I don't know. It's the, distribu it's the core level switching. And then you got your core access distribution. Is that the three tier? I think that's right. Sure. Um, so if you do the core one, cool. And if these are all the same model, fine. But if you do the core one first while you're sending bits down to one of the child elements, guess what? It's probably going to disconnect, and then that firmware will fail. Or worse scenario is that maybe it did finish, but something else went wrong, and now you can't get to that. This is just the idea that you need to be conscious of this when you build it. And then of course, firmware deployments, just like config change scripts or anything else, test first. If you don't have a micro lab, there are plenty of documents out there, including uh, a Thwack Camp session about setting up GNS3, just to have basically a tiny micro playground so you can see how this works. That's it. I mean, this is pretty simple. It ships out of the box with a whole bunch of firmware updates. There are people sharing additional firmware update templates. There's a bunch of people uh, sharing additional ones on Thwack every single day. 
So you can always say, eh, I need one for a Nexus 5K that's in an HA pairing and be like, oh, cool, there's one in Thwack, import. And then mm -hmm. obviously test, verify, then execute. So I just want to emphasize that GNS3, because a lot of the folks who use Orion aren't aware that GNS3 is part of the SolarWinds uh, umbrella. And uh, yeah, if you look at the WAC Camp sessions from last year, and there's also an ebook on this, you can create a GNS3, a fake virtual network that you monitor with your Orion environment. So you could have GNS3 running on a laptop and still monitor it within Orion and set up all of your exact routers in whatever configuration, you can actually import all of your configs and everything, and um, then practice pushing firmware or config updates or whatever to that fake environment. And if you blow it up, it's OK, because it doesn't really exist. And yeah. once you have that process down, you can do that. So it's a, it's a really cool uh, feature to use. Also um, a great learning tool for those junior admins. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, for, for people who are trying to learn networking in general, people who are learning, you know, practicing for the CCNA, people who want to model their environment in an, uh, a place that is truly safe, that isn't going to hurt anything anywhere. Um, so moving on, similarly, um, compliance remediation, I think, is a feature that if you've got NCM, you know what it is and you know how cool it is just from the built-in templates and reports that are there. However, I do want to point out that you can use, you can build your own compliance policies and reports that sort of pre-configure or auto-configure your devices. And I say it's, it's, it ain't SDN, it's not software-defined networking, but it is actually pretty close. I want to go to the bottom of the slide, though, and just remind everyone that you build the rule first, the thing that changes the element in the configuration first, then you create a policy that detects what's wrong, then you create a report that you apply to all your devices. So you're, but what you see first and what we're about to see is the, repo is the report and then everything else. So I just want to um, point that out. And then um, just, you know, in this case, compliance isn't compliance with a security policy or whatever. Compliance is actually talking about complying to the things I have internally. We do not use private as the SNMP uh, string. We do, you know, we always use AAA authentication. We, whatever, whatever, whatever. Our banner always has the, you know, please do not use this machine or we will hunt you down and shoot you or whatever, <laughs> like, you know, whatever the policies are. So the idea is that a box can hit your network and with almost no additional action, begin to configure itself into a particular state. Um, and I'll hopefully I'll remember, but I'll talk about what that process might look like. But what we're looking at here is um, the live stream folder. We've got a folder with reports in it. And then in the, um, the live streams reports folder, we've got uh, banner needs more Shazam because I am a child and I don't <laughs> create things. And so, so in is, that, so is you Shazam. Can see... Say again. So, so is Shazam. Yes. Also yes. A child. Yeah. <laughs> so this report um, tells me you know, which devices comply, which uh, devices don't. But I, I want to edit this. I want to dig into it. So again, remember, we're going backward here. Um, so we've got, again, the report that tells me what policy is in the report. If I go edit the policy, you know, and I can apply multiple policies. It doesn't have to be one. This just mm -hmm. happens to be the one policy that we've got here. Yep. Um, so if I want to go back and... Uh, edit the policy for a second. What we'll see is that the the um, say my name policy say my name yep. has contains just that the, one. Say again. It, it contains just that one. And what I like about the policies one. is that you can actually have it go against dynamic selection of nodes. So you can immediately say, "Don't check this particular thing for Cisco." Because it doesn't apply to Cisco, or it doesn't apply to this vendor, or for Cisco, it doesn't apply to the 12 track, it only applies to the 15 track of code. I want to get to the rule, and I'm sorry I'm clicking around a little bit, because I think that's where you were headed next. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. And it's got a little ruler icon. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, the so rule the is rule, we need the, a hero. We need a hero. Uh, or, yeah, and um, when you go in there, this is where the magic happens. So again, this is the thing you actually create first, and then you nest it inside all those other things. So here, what we're saying is I'm looking for a simple string. It, the banner has to have Shazam in it, okay? 
And if it doesn't have Shazam in it, then go run these commands to go fix it. Now, obviously, once again, test, test, test again, ask someone else to look at it, and maybe then roll it into production if you feel really comfortable about it. But you can have this remediation policy applied automatically to the box if it doesn't have Shazam on it. Or again, if you find the, string, the SNMP string that is public, then get rid of it or change it to whatever it is now. Or, or it just doesn't match what you have to find if you have these standards, if, it ma if it's in this location or it is this type of device, it needs to have this read write community string that is like this ungodly long, which is great, that's perfect. If this doesn't match, send it. Right. So how does this work in real life? Like, you know, are you really going around and just randomly applying these remediation actions? Probably not. What I do use it for, though, is in an environment, I know that every truly provisioned device has these attributes. Again, usually a banner or a string that I put into the config. And that tells me the thing has been completely provisioned and it's ready for production. So if I don't find that, I immediately re-IP the box into my uh, prep subnet. And it just moves into that environment. So any device that hasn't been fully provisioned gets itself the hell out of my production environment and into that prep network. If it's in the prep network, it's next policy. If it's in the prep network and it's missing this and it's missing that and it's missing that, I immediately apply those things and I change the custom property for the node into test or review or whatever. And that shows up in a report that goes to my network team. And the network team gets that every single day. And they say, here are all the boxes that went online, but they haven't been approved or finished or whatever it is. So you can have this workflow of provisioning. You also can have a workflow, and this is a little bit more complicated, where if an alert detects that a certain kind of traffic, maybe your NetFlow traffic, suddenly shows a spike in this kind of behavior. It's got a lot of SQL traffic, or it's got a lot of external traffic, or whatever it is, and it's more than this threshold, we're going to apply a new uh, traffic shaping rule to it that maybe balances things out. Now, that requires a little bit more knowledge of how your environment is built, but you can do these things with that compliance remediation that, again, it ain't full-on SDN, but it comes really close. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're a pure network engineer and you came from the CLI, then all of this just makes sense. That's where I started. The fact that uh, I had to work with firewalls that had a web interface annoyed me. Um, but it's one of those things that I used to use it for, like Liam was talking about, uh, new office. New office was actually my most common scenario. We didn't stand up a lot of places, but when we stood up a new office, the routers all had to have this. The uh, if I looked at the interface description and I looked at the sub interface description and it was most definitely this particular type of thing, but it didn't have the circuit ID number in the description, I need to know that because I need that in there because I have alerts that rely on that. And basically, even if you don't use NCM's policy stuff for the common, the HIPAA, the PCI DSS, the one I can never remember, uh, Stig, I can never remember, I think it's Stig. Um, yeah, if, if you don't use it for those, yeah. explore them, understand how they work with this kind of rules go to policies, policies go to reports, and build one or two for your own environment. You'd be surprised how many things are just slightly off, like how many things, if you're supposed to be using name servers, aren't pointing to good IP addresses for said name servers. Or if mm -hmm. you're using TACAX, they're pointing to boxes that no longer exist. Totally worthwhile. Because, right. you know, we're human. Yeah. And people have scripts they've saved in Notepad that they just copy and paste into Putty. Right, right. And that's good to a point. All right, uh, dynamic remediation actions. I just want to, I, no, no, I'm gonna stay here. I wanna show this screen because I think realistically, people use one, yep. two of these. Yep. I yep. think Nine the most common is there are two of these that are used. look at this list. They just send an email. <sighs> yeah. Now, granted, send an email slash page is the default. About this. 
<laughs> so sad. I'm very passionate. I've talked about this several times this year in different various webinars and like longer length of, of time to talk about these specifically. So we're just going to go over them at kind of a high level. But I do want to talk about this. If an action is consistently repeatable, automate it. <laughs> If an action, a reaction to a problem is consistently repeatable, if every time this happens, you refresh that app pool, if every time this happens, you restart a service, whatever it happens to be, if it is that repeatable that you have to go log in and do the thing every time to every one of these boxes, specific boxes, and you're doing it every time, and I know loads of people who do this, you're getting you you you're it, you're taking more time than you need to first of all because and it's it's more manual than it needs to be because if you're doing it every time consistently every time right now you have to take the time to wait for that email to come in because it can take like up to 5 minutes to get to you from when it was detected you're going to get that email finally then you have to go log into the box and then you have to go manually restart it and this all takes time especially if it's um let's say there's a memory leak on a box or something and you would normally just restart this service that's causing a memory leak regularly um and instead now you have to go hard boot the box because it's reached a point of the memory leak being so bad that you can't even you can't log in it. seen it it's been a thing it's bad um, so if you have these repeatable actions that you can do, if it's consistently repeatable, set it up with an alert man, like automate your way out of it, save yourself some time. I will also say, make sure that you also do the log and NPM event, log it. We restarted it at this time. It automatically does that because then when you're doing your remediation lighter, or if you're having to do root cause analysis, you can say, okay, well, it fixed itself at this time. So now we know where exactly to look in the logs. We know exactly when we need to go look in the server logs. Yes. Yeah, so um, the thing I want to point out is that going back to what Kevin said a little bit earlier about you know, asking people, if the monitoring doesn't do something for them, it's useless and they're going to ignore it. And also, Crystal, to what you said about you should be talking to people, you should be getting out there. And mm -hmm. the, the interviewing process starts off with, okay, so how do you know when it goes wrong? Right. Oh, I, you know, it, it does this behavior. It goes offline. It stops being able to push this stuff. So how do you verify it's wrong? Well, I jump on the box and I type the Grafrinkle command and it gives me a null pointer or whatever. OK, fine. That's how you ver that's your alert. But then the next important question is, and what do you do about it when that happens? Yeah. Oh, I get on the box and I can go for, for Gurgle and for Gurgle usually starts it back up again. As a, how about I type for Gurgle for you, and if that doesn't bring the service back, then we go do this other thing. How, you know, there was one environment I was in that was having somewhere on the order of 300 disk full tickets per month. And the majority of the time it was clearing the temp directory. It yeah. didn't need a new drive. Yeah. It didn't, it was just terrible. So we wrote a script that cleared the temp directory as the first human action. It just would bounce on the, jump on the box, clear the temp directory, and then walk away. And if that if that alert didn't, um, if that alert went away, the then the alert was reversed. But if it persisted, then it created a ticket. We went from 300 to 10 tickets a month. Now you also have to look and see which boxes are filling their temp directory constantly and they're just sort of sawtooth thing. So it's a thing, but you know, I get to Crystal to your point, like if you if your action is almost a habit, a reflex, that needs to be automated. Yeah. Uh, and I want to point out some of these actions. So because we're working in an environment that has all of the Orion modules, um, you might not see some of these options. I do want to point that out. There's a big chunk in there that's a bunch of virtualization stuff that comes from vMan. So if you don't have vMan, you don't have those options. Um, but they are useful. I mean, it's the same action you're going to take anyway. <laughs> you, yeah. can have, you can have Orion do it. Um, I also really want to point out that there's a couple of execute script and execute um, a, an external program commands that you can use to execute batch files. You can um, use to actually run a different program if it needs to do that, like you have some other program that you're using. You can have Orion do that for cool. you. So you don't have to be the scripter. Mm -hmm. We did want to bring that up. You don't have to be the person that wrote the script. Leon's example was really good of like, this guy runs the same script every time. That is probably a, a thing that happens. I, I am not a person that codes or scripts in any capacity. I like to say that I know enough PowerShell to be dangerous, and that's about it. 
Um, I don't uh, I don't do that, but I can set up these actions to execute scripts for other people. I've done it many times. You don't have to be the scripter. You just need to know what the parameters you need are and you need to know where it exists so that you can execute that script against the device. Um, I also, you know, going back to the previous slide, I it's in capital letters on there and I wanna make sure and talk about testing, okay? So especially if you're executing a script or an external program or something that's gonna shut something down completely, um, find a test first. Um, and we did, I didn't put it on here, but some of these actions also have a simulate option, which you can use in Orion. The simulate option is newer, like in the last five years or so. Um, so if you are an older Orion customer and you haven't paid attention to that new thing being added, it is, it is there. It doesn't work for everything, um, but it is important. So always, always also log it so that you have a paper trail, you have a record of when these things are happening. Test everything before yeah. you put it into production. <laughs> um, always will say that. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can you can set these up. And I, I can see that um, Kevin has on the screen here uh, where it's waiting an, a certain amount of time and then doing another action. You can do this with any of your alerts and any of your alert actions. So if one of the actions is after it's been 10 minutes or whatever, now you send an email, maybe that's the thing. Um, but Listen, people like to ignore email from monitoring systems. So if it's not worth the time, if they're getting 700 alerts in an, in their email, they're going to do the thing that we all talk about and we all hate, which is they're going to create a folder with a rule or a rule that sends everything to the trash. Uh, and then they'll be like, why didn't we get this? Why didn't we know that the server was down? And it'll be their fault, but they won't admit to it. <laughs> I also want to point out that um, that that cascade of events is predicated on the idea that the alert is still true. Active. If at any point in that process the alert it fixes the problem goes away, those next steps don't occur. True. Yeah. So this one was write a log, and the number of people who don't use escalation levels actually annoys me. Because it's not a bad thing, because especially when you're getting started, but escalation levels will save you so much work, especially if you have the Gerfrinkle command, which will automatically fix this thing. So you build your alert. Your first one is write a log, you know, alert detected at such and such time. We are going to do this. Then you do the thing. Then you wait 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever. And that'll depend on your polling frequency of your alerts and also the polling frequency of the server. There's a whole melange there we could get into. Um, yeah. But look at those two. Make sure that something goes through. This is why test important. Then if it still happens, then write another log, do this thing. And if it still doesn't work, then write a log and then send your email. Now, is the problem in theory been going on for 20 minutes now? Maybe. Is that really a catastrophic problem? That depends on your environment. That's why these are all completely customizable. In this case that I'm showing, this is a low disk space. As long as, it is a 90, as, long as it's not at 99.5 and increasing, this is probably fine to wait 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah, and I have a theory that um, I, people don't use escalations as much based on um, how many people and different companies and teams I've worked with on this. People don't use escalations as much because they think of it only in terms of like on-call processes or uh, management processes. And because of that, they don't see the they don't see the wider capabilities of using those escalations to just wait a certain period of time and then execute the next action. Yeah. Um, so hopefully. Now that we've went through it today, that, that will garner some ideas. I also really want to point out that we've, we've brought up lots of use case scenarios today and examples, but it's by no means all or any of the possibilities or uh, maybe won't suit your environment. So use your imaginations. Check out Thwack. You guys are amazing on Thwack. You share all the awesome things that you're doing. And there's always more to be shared. Things can be imported all over the place from compliance policies to like all kinds of things. So if somebody else already built it and you don't have to, that's more saving time. That's not yep. automation, it's just saving time. <laughs> right. I, I also want to point out again to the to the your point about um you know using these escalations. Another thing that people don't think about doing is it I can't fix it 
well, what do you do? Well, I check these five commands and I gather that information and that tells me what to happen next. Fine, do those five commands, pipe that data into the ticket, and that way the person who answers the ticket already has those commands, already has that information. Just do an information gathering process of a few different scripted commands and pump that out. That person now doesn't have to log onto the box and get that information. It was gathered at the time of the event. That's also a valid escalation action. Yeah. Yes. And that's all about the discussions. Why do you need an alert? What do you do when you run into it? How do you know it's cleared? What happens if you can't fix it immediately? Yeah. Uh, the scripted yeah. stuff, we will just touch on. I know we are running a little long. Look, shocked. This is my shocked face. Um, <laughs> it's only five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're doing great for us. Uh, <laughs> So at Crystal said you can either create a shared folder in your environment, on your Orion server, or on some other location. This is where a separate group of people maintain the scripts. And then your job is to go through that alert wizard and be like, what would trigger this? Basically the alert trigger. And then say, execute an external program. That external program is path to executable. Normally the path to the script file and then any parameters. Is it long? Yeah, it's long. And you're not just running command.exe. But that means it's no longer your problem. Yeah. The other thing that's great about this is you can be like, do you want me to only take this action during business hours? Or better yet, do you want me to only take this action during non-business hours where you're not already working on something? The alert actions are something that people don't look at enough. And between the alert actions and the, tr and the reset actions, you've got a lot of flexibility. What ships out of the box is fine, but don't don't stick with that. You need to really salt the taste. Um, yeah. One other thing Crystal mentioned when we were doing our dry run was that this scripts folder, regardless of where it lives, would be an excellent thing to point server configuration monitor at to see when people make changes to these scripts. That way, if they say, well, it stopped working, you can be like, oh, well, Jerry changed it on this date. Here's the original file. Why don't you put that back where it belongs? Yep. And all, all right. of this stuff that we've talked about today is just what I like to call the built-in automation. This isn't yeah. even the custom stuff. This isn't the API. This is like, this is just built-in options that you can use. It doesn't require scripting. It doesn't require you to be a developer. It doesn't require you to have worked with the product for like a million years. Okay. It's like, it's there for you. Um, obviously all these links are to like various documentation and video and stuff so that you can go look at how to configure these things. We will have we these when we part. publish the video, we'll <laughs> list it underneath so you have quick access to them. Uh, I just wanted to show it real fast and we're ready for questions. I, my chat is way over here on a tiny monitor. Did we get anything yeah. fun come in that we have to cover? A lot. Oh, Actually, good. Yeah, there's loads of, of questions. Things. Yay. Um, let me let me roll back. Well, I'll start. I'll start at the at the top that our wonderful um, moderators have put in our chat. Um, can we remove the monitored resources automatically if no longer available on nodes? The answer to that depends on what it is, and also it may require the API. <laughs> I will say there is a scenario about that that we will be covering on December 9th, Care of uh, one of the MVPs, a guy named Ben. And it's, there's actually already a post about it on Thwack. Search for the curious case of the dead nodes, because um, we have to be clever about titles. Uh, it's <laughs> There's a whole thing in there and how to do stuff and with the power shelling and all kinds of, it, you can be done, it's with the API, but it's a really clever way to kind of be the precursor to complete deletion. All right, yeah. someone read another question. I gotta get another water. Uh, next question, can we assign the custom properties via discovery? Um, and the answer to that is no, unfortunately, that is not currently a capability. You can assign them with alerting like we brought up today. Um, you can also do it via the API, which will probably be brought up next time with more information, um, but there's not currently a way to do it through the actual discovery. I have seen some magical API things in the past where they've used the actual discovery results to go and do other magical things. So um, it's possible with the API, it is not uh, with just the discovery by itself. Yeah, it's, it will not be a light lift. There's lots of discussions and that's why I like yeah. using the learning engine to do it for me, because I'm yeah. lazy. <laughs> True. 
Sorry. Uh, next um, question. So wild if you're buzz, in a retail so, environment, so you, you have many oh, sites. On. Can you build groups automatically and then add the mm -hmm. dynamic query based on the store number that's in the group name? I, I was going to say, and also you mentioned Ben, uh, you know, Ben Keen, and he's actually been in, he's been in our chats uh and answering uh, questions been answering these things out so yeah it, it you know ben is why we love our mvps and he did it yeah so um, um, as far as the retail site one uh yeah you can requires the api sorry you can't you building groups everything we showed today is all through point and click the ui it's all through the web interface and that's done intentionally mm -hmm. this is the precursor to get those ideas flowing so if there's something, there will be a poll survey, something where we're going to ask for feedback on this. If there's a specific scenario you want to see, we basically have a month to get ready for the next live cast. Put it in there. Let us know if you have a specific scenario you'd like to see. And if we can cover it, we will. Uh, the dynamic parts are actually not that hard. The, the, there are a couple of examples in the Orion SDK uh, up on GitHub, uh, slash samples, slash your language of choice. And in there, those like, create a group, create a group with dynamic, create, it's all in there. Uh, you can probably copy and paste most of it. Um, I've had a lot of people do this. I wish I could have done it. Uh, I had 37 sites in the US and something like 118 globally, or in, like even counting the tiny ones, and building groups for all of that took me a while. So awesome. another one. Um, the, any thoughts on multiple tiers of dependencies? For example, you've got a WAN router connected to a LAN switch, <laughs> connected to a server, and uh, you know, as far as dependencies. And I will say that was one of the first use cases that I had for uh, dependencies. And the way that I did it, just I mean, not the only way, is to take in my in my headquarters the interface that is on the WAN router is the parent of the remote router the remote site router, mm -hmm. so that if either one of those went down, I didn't see anything beyond that. And then the remote router was the parent of the, in my case, load balanced uh, MF switches. And then, uh, then all those were connected to everything behind it. And everything behind that was just by IP address. Now the switches and the router had to be in their own dynamic, their own group. And the group was uh, anything that was this type of device and this IP address, and um, but then the everything else had to be everything in this IP address except the router, except the switch. Yeah. So yeah. I had to exclude those so that they would show down. Anyway, there's some, some I, things to do with that. Yeah. I have also a working example, which is similar, but not exactly the same. So I worked with a client that had basically, I think it was six different groups for each site and they would create um, so you have your, your dependency site. So what you're talking about is multi-layer, right? So instead of just having a group for the LAN switches and a group for the servers and a group for the WAN router or routers, if you had a um, backup, you would also have a group that contains the LAN switches and the server. So like another group, and that group would become the dependency for the WAN router, where you'd have a dependency, a child, uh, a child object of the servers for the LAN switch. So you would you would have multiple dependencies for each site essentially, but you can use another a group of groups effectively, a group mm -hmm. of groups to take care of that uh, multiple tiers, so that everything that's behind it would still get tagged. It's just being another group. Yeah, it's hard to explain. You kind of have to do the sock puppet thing when we're trying to tell yeah. you about it. But once you go through it a couple of times, it makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, but feel and free don't to, have to do the applications. In, uh, messages on Dwight. Yeah. And you don't have to do the applications after that because the applications are part of the application stack. So if you have Zam, VMAN, SRM, WPM, if you have those products, then those are automatically children of the node. So if the node goes down, we're also not going to alert you on these 600 applications because Sam knows that the node is down and therefore I can't get to these anyway. So really, a yeah. lot of these dependencies are mostly, not exclusively, but mostly we've seen in the wild yeah. is for network gear, where mm -hmm. understanding where things are going is, you, although you may be able with Orion to figure out where the physical copper is, understanding the actual architecture inside of the in-memory iOS or Juno S or whatever is more complex and needs a human's touch. And realistically, mm -hmm. there is no right way Right. It's what works for you. Yeah. You can go as simple or as in-depth as you want. I like simple to start 
And then when someone says, why didn't we know about this? Or I'm tired of this, then you say, let's talk about that. Let's get more complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sim get, simple is best to start because it. it's easier to find the fault if something did go wrong. So here's um, what so that I, I wasn't question. sure about. Um, oh, can you dynamically list the children of a dependent device in an alert email when the dependent device goes down? Um, example, the dependent is a site router, alert list, all affected equipment in that site in the new one. So the, um, that would be the parent object, would be the site router. Um, I believe you can do this, but I think that it requires a custom SQL or SQL variable to pull the dependencies into the alert. Um, somebody else correct me if I'm wrong about that, but uh, I believe I'll have to confirm able to do that. Just, I know that there is a, a, it depends how many, how deep you want to go as far as children. That's the scary mm -hmm. bit. Uh, if you yeah. just want to go like to the node level or the top level, that's fine. If you want the nodes, the applications, the devices, the interfaces, the it's you know, app, much uh, more complicated. Uh, yeah. yeah that, realistically, I think there is a, and I'll get back to that. I think this is one we'll take to the water cooler and answer. I think there may be an out of the box thing for something with uh, description, like child description status. Yes. I don't know if that is works for dependencies. Yeah, we will we'll need to f come back to that. <laughs> yeah. But it's a great um, one if you I have an actual is... scenario. What? No, I was just saying if someone has a scenario like that where they have done this, please put it out on Thwack somewhere or reach out to one of us and we will make sure we can get it out there so we can answer everybody. Yep. Uh, okay, the last question I can see in our uh, sidebar here is tree of dependencies works well. Is it the whole site just a switch is worth or just one server? Uh, it really depends on your setup. Um, so you can do whatever you want. You can put one device in in there in the dependency. You don't need to use the dynamic groups. I like the dynamic groups for the example that we gave um, just because then you don't have to do any care and feeding of it. Um, yeah. If you do have single devices, it's a lot more manual labor. And that's so where I, it, it having depend the on your site. <laughs> alerting engine assign a custom property. That custom property fill in a dynamic group. That dynamic group have applications sent to it. And then you're alerting to then build off of those. It's a whole ecosystem. Uh, we are well Way over. over time. Yeah. Like I, I everyone here is like getting angry. Yeah, I know. Shock. Yeah. Yeah, um, I do want to quickly thank our MVPs in the chat for answering questions while we were doing this. Um, that was fantastic of you, and we love you. Um, I also want to thank you guys in the Thought community for doing all your sharing, um, because this is how everyone gets to to do these things, and we learn and grow by sharing with each other. And sometimes I'm sure Solar Ones is surprised by the things that y'all do with the software. So I'm I've been in UX sessions; it's a thing. Um, so you know, just. Thank you for being awesome and continue to be awesome. And if you have more questions or you have, like uh, Kevin said, more specific questions that are gonna go into the API level, more difficult automation, uh, send them to us so that we can do it for next time. Yep, there is I an extra survey. Say, I encourage uh, everyone uh, to do that. Fill I in your THWACK ID so we can throw fake internet points at you or whatever we're doing with the results. Uh, but we're gonna use that to, if, we, if it doesn't feed directly into the next stream, it may be the ones after that. Uh, I, I also want to just jump in here for a second and just point out that you're probably some of you are probably hearing this an annoyingly uh, great amount today and almost never uh, any other day of the year. But for those people who have uh, served in the armed forces, uh, hoping you have a happy Veterans Day and thank you very much for uh, all of your sacrifices and all that stuff. And again, hopefully tomorrow is also Veterans Recognition Day and the day after that and the day after that, you know, but for today, we just wanted to say thank you. All right, so I guess that's it for myself, Leon, and Crystal. We will see you next time. Thanks, Ab. Uh.